So I decided myself that I will install Gen 2 Linux. And when I started looking into that, there is quite a lot of good information on the Gen 2 wiki, but I was a bit too lazy to read and I wanted just to get some video, just something brief to tell me more about what type of choices to make during the installation. And then uh, I, I started looking through YouTube and I found out that there's almost nothing on YouTube from Gen 2. And well, that was a bit boring, but then I thought that with nothing, if no one else has done any videos yet, I might as well do some videos myself. And well, it will be the kind of videos that I would want to have myself. But before uh, I would go into that, first of all, I have to learn myself. <laughs> so it will take quite a bit of time before I start producing any videos. Uh, but when someone finds this playlist, about how to install and use Gen 2 in a good way. Uh, maybe they don't know what Gen 2 is and, and why they should use it. So I thought I'm going to start by just explaining shortly what Gen 2 is and why should you use Gen 2, if you didn't already know that. If you already know that, just skip this video. So to explain this in a way that maybe everyone can understand, just in case someone stumbled in here who doesn't know anything about computers, I thought that, well, everyone knows something about cars. So let's, let's make a scenario for comparison where what if everyone could have any car they wanted and they could get that car for free, but they're limited to one parking space. So you can choose any car you want, but you can only have one parking space. You can only have one car. What car would you choose? Well, one of the most expensive cars right now is the Bugatti Veyron, which is supposedly one of the fastest cars in the world, uh, super expensive, uh, like handmade Italian masterpiece. Is that the car that everyone would pick if they could pick anything? Probably not. Because, first of all, if you've never driven a sports car, and you get into a really, really fast sports car like the Bugatti Veyron, you're going to sit there and you're going to be scared shitless. And you're going to say, please, someone save me. Because it's just, I mean, there's a lot of power there. It's very easy to just well, kill yourself. But also, just if you're going to go grocery shopping, you, you don't have anywhere to put anything. You can't load anything because the car is not made to transport things. That car is just made to go really fast. Uh, and if you're going to go to a party, you have some nice clothes on, you can barely get in or out of the car because it's not made to be comfortable to get in and out of. The noise of the engine is super loud. You can almost not hear your passenger talking. So, no, I don't think most people would get that car. 
uh, what they would get is something more common and trivial, something that they think is useful. And actually, I mean, this is a bit uh, simplified, oversimplified. But I guess most people would actually go with something like the Volkswagen bus. First of all, it is a Volkswagen, which means the people's wagon or the people's car. It's supposed to be a car that everyone uses. I mean, it's slow. You always have to go and fix it, but there's lots of space. You can use it in many different ways. You can sleep in it. You can uh, drive all of your friends around. Uh, and it's very familiar and iconic and people look at you when you drive a Volkswagen and they're gonna say that yeah that's a solid guy of course you could also go for a very standard car like the Toyota Corolla and maybe that's what most people would actually go for I don't know it's not the same usefulness as the Volkswagen but but it's very easy to draw some parallels here to operating systems and because Windows is what everyone uses, because it's just familiar. It's, it's what everyone just has on their computer. They don't really have a reason to go and get something else. Whereas Linux is a lot better in pretty much every way, except that you have to learn a few things to use it. So you have to spend a little bit more time with the computer if you're going to run Linux. And that little bit more time makes people say that, no, they don't want it. Which is why I think that people are not going to want to go exchange their, I don't know, Toyota Corolla or something else just to freight some stuff. They want to have something that they never have to change anything. They can just take it and go, no matter what they're going to do, which is the Volkswagen bus in the example. Now, I put Arch Linux and Gentoo on the Bugatti Veyron because they're the fastest operating systems. But they're not as impractical as the Bugatti Veyron is. It's more that you have to spend spend a whole lot of time learning how to use it, um, which does make it unpractical for a lot of people. <clears throat> but if you are that kind of person who has a lot of time to spend, or wants to spend that time, then it's not unpractical anymore. So let's go over to more uh, operating system oriented comparison a Windows, Macintosh or Linux. I just tried to think like some general terms. If if you just take some random person, what is the probability of that random person being a Linux user? Well if they're only spending a little time at the computer then there's no point in switching to Linux or and especially not Gen 2 because in that little time they don't have time to learn what you need to know to get around. If you spend some time then you can learn a bit about Linux and start to use it especially if you use some specialist some specialist software like Sage Math that I am going to use. Uh, Sage Math only runs on Linux. It doesn't run on Windows. So you have to install Linux in order to use Sage Math. So if you have some specialist software like that that only exists on Linux, of course you're going to be more likely to use that operating system. 
you might also be a bit more likely to use Linux if you have some control issues and you want to control everything. You want this to have be done in a very specific way. In Linux, you have the option to control everything, uh, which you don't have in Windows or Macintosh. And uh, then you will have a bit more likelihood of using it. But maybe not. If you just spend some time at the computer, maybe you won't be that likely to use it. But the more time you spend at the computer, the more likely you will be to start using Linux or Gen2 at some point in time. Because the real hindrance to start using Linux is that you need to learn a few things. And learning those things is a bit of a threshold to overcome. But once you learn it, you know it. And then using Linux is better in many ways than using Windows. Except, of course, that then you come to the other uh, version of this specialist software that even though you spend uh, a lot of your time at the computer, you can sometimes use some specialist software, uh, which it requires you to use Windows. So right now, I have Linux on one laptop over there, and I have Windows on this one, where I am recording this video. And the reason why I use Windows here is because I'm running a presentation. So on the Linux laptop, I have OpenOffice or uh, LibreOffice, which it's called now. And uh, in that Office suite, I have a presentation software. But in the presentation software in Linux, I don't have any fancy mm, visual themes like this one. I, I can make it, I can make my own visual themes and make it very fancy, but they're not included in the default installation. So again, if I'm just spending a little time at the computer or some time at the computer and I have to make a presentation, well, in the Windows software, I have to pay some money for it, but I get these fancy things. Whereas in Linux, I have to make it myself. If I spend a lot of time at the computer, and if I uh, do presentations all the time, I might as well switch to Linux because in the end, it's going to be better. And I can make those fancy visual themes myself because if I spend all my time at the computer, the time to make those themes is not going to be that much. So, the effort of using this every operating system. If we look at Windows and OS X, which is Macintosh, there's very little effort to get started. And if you just spend some small amount of time by the computer, then it, it makes sense to choose Windows or Macintosh. Uh, if you spend all your time at the computer, it makes less and less sense to choose Windows and Macintosh because you're going to spend a lot of effort working around things that are a bit annoying. Um, whereas in Linux, you have a high effort to get started, which means that if you just spend some small t amount of time, all of the time that you spend at the computer will be to just get started trying to use your computer. But the more time you spend, you already got over that threshold of learning how to use it, and then uh, it will be very little effort to continue because you have so much control over everything that uh, you're going to spend a lot less effort being frustrated at what you can't change. So let's talk about what an operating system is. Because this is really about how to make a choice about which operating system to use. But then we need to know what is an operating system. So what we're going to talk about is how does a computer work? How are we controlling our computer? And what are the options for gaining access to all the capabilities that my 
my machine has to offer. So a computer is a machine. You have a processor to compute some tasks. You have some memory to work with. Uh, you have a screen to show information. You have a keyboard to give some information. You probably have a mouse or something else as well. Some speakers to give information. And all of this is loaded into a basic input-output system, or a BIOS. This is the way it's been since the 1980s when IBM defined the first PC, personal computer. So in the very, very, very beginning of computers, you would have just a system to give you access to the keyboard to so you're able to enter some commands. And then you have some feedback systems to give you the, the result of your commands. And you have the processor and memory to execute your commands. I actually know a guy who was in, back in the day, long time ago, after you start the computer and the basic input output system gave you access to this, you have to program one zero zero one 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 zero 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 one zero zero one one zero. Where every zero is letting a transistor be closed and every one lets a transistor be open and you use ones and zeros to open and close transistors in a very complicated way to direct current through your machine and make it do things. So in the beginning, you have to really know everything about the electronics of a computer in order to use it. But at, as the computers grew more complicated, they didn't want to always write the code for how to print something on the screen. So they made a dedicated graphics card to deal with how to print on the screen. And they made a driver for that graphics card that had all the ones and zeros to instruct it. And you just told the driver to put a blue square on the screen. Uh, so it simplified a lot of ways of how to use the computer. So you start a computer, you get access to the drivers. But even programming drivers is very complicated, so they wanted something even easier. So then they came up with this idea of the operating system. This may not be technically correct in every detail, whatever. I'm, I'm trying to describe the concept. So the operating system is started by the BIOS to give you a more simple access to the hardware through the drivers and everything. Uh, and then when the operating system is running, you can start all of your software, like PowerPoint, to uh, gain access to the screen, the graphics card, do a presentation. Uh, so PowerPoint asked Windows, in this case, uh, to draw something on the screen, get input from the mouse and keyboard, and change the mouse pointer as I am moving my mouse around. Maybe I should change this to the laser pointer instead. So uh, the network card it's just some, it's a card with some electronics on it. And it's facilitating some communication with other computers. And other computers can talk to you. And you need to have some easy access to that. So you have drivers and the operating system to handle it for you. The sound card is a math processor with fast Fourier transforms and stuff like that. No one wants to know the math of that. They just want to play some music. So you have a sound card with drivers to it to use it and an operating system that knows how to use the drivers. And then you have the media player that communicates with the operating system 
the drivers and you just select a song to play. And of course, sound goes to the speakers. The graphics card is also just a processor, lots of computing power to figure things out how to display things on the screen. You don't want to program that every time, so you have the operating system to manage it for you. Uh, so how does this work? How does the computer, how do you get from having the computer in front of you, you hit the on button, what's going to happen? Well, you have two choices. You have the BIOS and the UEFI. Uh, the BIOS is the basic input output system. It's been around since 1980s, so almost 40 years or around 40 years. Uh, basically what it does is that the BIOS takes control of the screen and the keyboard and everything. It checks that there is some hard drive, which is the memory where you store things. And on the hard drive, there is a master boot record. And then on the master boot record, you have four different partitions of the hard drive. So the hard drive has four different parts. Sometimes you're just going to use one part and you have three empty parts. But you can never have more than four parts. So the bootstrap code is going to read the partition table and it's going to check on which of these partition is the operating system. And it can the operating system can be on any of these four partitions. Uh, usually it's on partition number one, so then it's going to go there uh, to read how to continue. So on the if it's partition number one, it's going to jump to that partition on the disk. And then the first thing it's going to do is jump to the bootstrap code, which tells you where the rest of the operating system is, which file starts the operating system on this computer. Uh, and that file is in the file system. So then you have to, this code has to know which file it is, and it has to go to the file system to find it, find the position of it on the disk, and start reading it and load the operating system. And the operating system will um, get access to all the hardware instead of the BIOS. The th thing is that uh, it's very common for people to say that I want to have more than one operating system. For example, I want to run Linux and Windows on the same machine. But when I start the machine, I want to say that today I need to run Windows because I'm going to do some PowerPoint. And then you reboot the machine and you say that now I'm going to start Linux because I'm going to do, I'm going to use Sage Math. So then people started using bootloaders instead of the operating system directly. And the bootloader is going to have a list of which operating systems to use. So it's kind of the MVR, the master boot record, will instead of starting the operating system directly, it will first start the bootloader. And then the bootloader will start the operating system. And there are a few different bootloaders, but here are some of the common ones. Um, so if we have a BIOS computer, which is the old uh, standard, it's going to you turn on the hardware. The hardware is going to start the basic input output system. Uh, it's going to access the hard drive, which is memory, and read where is the bootloader. The bootloader is going to find the operating system, which will be started to use the drivers and access all of the hardware. And you can start your software after that. But there is another, another way to start your computer, 
because people got kind of annoyed at this old clunky system. It's not so good because it's old. It was good when it was new, but now it's not new and now it's 40 years old. So they came up with a new thing called UEFI, uh, which is the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. So firmware is the drivers that are connected to all of the hardware. So this is the firmware interface to keep track of all of the hardware and start the operating system and hand it off. So there is a UEFI CSM which just says that, well, if you have a hard drive from before that has the old MBR style formatting on the hard drive, then it will just read 512 bytes of MBR and go from there. So it will be like you had a BIOS. But for the real UEFI, uh, you don't have just 512 bytes of MBR, which is the old system. You have any size you want. Uh, and you can have any number of partitions as well, uh, where you put a bootloader to start the operating system. So since you have any size you want, you can put so much more in terms of drivers and, and to control the hardware even before you start the operating system. So when you start the system in BIOS, you go to the MBR on the hard drive, you start a bootloader who starts the operating system. UEFI has its own definition of the hard drive that is not master boot record. The master boot record only has four partitions but they came up with a new way of describing that, which is called the GPT, which is the GUID partition table or something like that. Uh, so the GPT can have any number of partitions, pretty much. Uh, so the UEFI finds a system partition where an OS is described. And you can have several system partitions. And then they run the UEFI applications to launch the operating system. And that essentially means that UEFI is a bootloader. So instead of having this old system, they invented a new system to replace all of that. But people really like their old stuff. They don't want to change their way. So a lot of people actually use UEFI to start a bootloader like Grub, <laughs> which is a bit unnecessary, but you can do that. Why not? And then it would be the same as to start the operating system. So once we go through that, we have loaded the operating system. And in Gen 2, it's going to look like this. Thank you for using Gen 2 Linux. The Linux is the operating system. You have a prompt with your username, which in this case is the live CD, so yeah, it's not actually an installed system, but never mind that. Uh, and when you're here, you can write some commands, like in this case, he's getting some uh, information about his processor, he's getting some information about his hard drive, and he's getting some information about his uh, random access memory. So this is all you need from an operating system. The operating system is accessing your hardware and giving it, giving it to you. And this is what Linux is. But Windows is a lot different from this. Windows is a graphical user interface. You don't need to write a lot of commands. You can just use your mouse to move around. And in many ways, this is easier. And of course, this exists in, in the Linux world as well. But you're not forced into it. You can just get the operating system running. And then it's your choice. If you want to start a graphical user interface, you can do that. If you don't want to start a graphical user interface, you can just use the keyboard and write commands. In Windows, you don't have that choice. And in Macintosh, 
you don't have that choice. So uh, they are easy to start with, but it can get a bit frustrating when you get better at using your computer and you want to have that choice. So what is an operating system? Well, actually, Windows is not an operating system. Windows uses the disk operating system, which is DOS. And Windows is something between the operating system and the software. So let's talk about that. In Linux, uh, you start the computer you get that prompt, which is just text and keyboard. You use your keyboard to give commands to the computer and what you want to do. If you want to control uh, a computer with a graphical user face, you start a window client. And in the Unix world, this is called X. The thing is that Linux is perfectly aware of the internet and having lots of computers in a network. So you can actually start a window client to a totally different computer over there on the other side of the world or anywhere you want if you can log on with some username. Uh, so when you start Linux, and it goes into some Windows mode, it's going to start an X server on this computer, and then it's going to start an X client to connect to the server on this computer. But you could also go from that command line interface and just write the command to start an X client and connect to a different computer running X server. In Windows, you don't have a choice. You're just going to use this computer. That's it. Now, there are also many ways in Linux to control your experience and, and what you see. And the design of the Windows environment in Linux is called the desktop environment. So in the beginning, these are years out here. In the beginning, there were GNOME and there were XFCE and there were KDE. And they still exist today. Uh, they all exist today, XFCE as well. But GNOME uh, was kind of branched out into Mate and Cinnamon were kind of like known but a bit different. And then someone thought that these are a bit too much, so they made LXDE, which is a lightweight system. And then Ubuntu became a really big thing, and they were using GNOME, but they thought that, well, if we're such a big thing, we should make our own thing, and then they made Unity. And there are many others as well, that you can use uh, to present the windows to you. So the desktop environment is something you use to make a different look and feel to your windows. And in Linux, you have many different choices on what desktop environment you can use. In Windows, you don't have a choice. You just have Windows. And in Mac OS X, you don't have a choice, you just have OS X or Mac OS as it's called now. So the point about running Linux is that you have a lot of choices to make, which is great because you can choose what you like best. But it's also a bit painful because you have to find out what is it you like. You have to learn a lot about all of these different things. So in Windows, the operating system is DOS, the disk operating system. They don't really have a Windows server, as far as I'm aware. They don't have a Windows manager, as far as I'm aware. Uh, but they do have the desktop environment, which is Windows. 
You can access DOS in Windows if you run the command line tool, the, the command prompt. Um, in Mac OS X, the operating system is Darwin, which is based on the SNU. So this is also a lit version of Unix, same as Linux, but it's a different uh, implementation of Unix. So their Windows Server is called Windows Server. Their Windows Manager is called Finder, I guess. This is a bit confusing to me in OS X. But I think that the Windows Manager is Finder and the desktop environment is Aqua. So OS X actually have a lot of the things, a lot of the components that you would have in, in Linux or other Unix versions. You don't have that in Windows. You don't have any freedom of choice. In OS X, you have something else than Finder uh, that you can switch to. So you can make some different choices in OS X, but it's, it's not much. In, a, in Linux, you have lots of lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of choices. And because there's so many choices, it's it's a bit daunting for new users to get into it. So then they made this, uh, they, they call it distributions of Linux. And they're going to say that here we have Ubuntu. Ubuntu uses Linux, but it will automatically start Xorg as a Windows server with Compass as a window manager and Unity as the desktop environment. And then you will have something that is kind of like OS X or Windows that you start the computer and it will be a graphical user interface. You use your mouse, not your keyboard. Same thing with, for example, Red Hat. You have Linux, Xorg, but Metacity window manager and the GNOME desktop environment. And you have many different distributions to combine these uh, components in a way that people like. So Gen2, which this will be about, is Linux, and you start with Linux, and after you install Gen2, you don't have anything else than Linux on your machine. You just have the command prompt. So then you have to choose the Windows Server. And in this case, there really is only one Windows Server for Linux that works. So Xorg is the only choice that is reasonable at this point. But after that, you can choose whatever you want for anything. But that also means that you have to know what you have to choose from, and you, want, you have to know what you want to choose. So this is the more difficult path to take but it's also the path where you have 100% freedom. So why should you use Gen2? Well, because it's Linux, which means that it's not managed by the evil multinational corporations, which are just out to make you a mindful drone or something. Mindless drone. Oops. Uh, the other reason to use Gen 2 is because it's free, as in free beer. It doesn't have a cost attached to it, and that's a nice philosophy. And you should support people who spend their time to give you something for free. It's also good to use Gen 2 because it's open source, and you can actually view the source, the programming language of all the software that you use, and you can change it uh, to write it whatever you want. And the good thing about being open source is that you know exactly what is happening in the computer. Well, if you're able to understand computer programming. But uh, in the end, it will be a much safer environment because you don't have anyone spying on you like these guys do, especially Microsoft and Windows, like to re record lots of data on you as a user. And they use data data to send advertisements and stuff too. Uh, so with open source, you can just see that there is no one doing anything suspicious with your information. 
And also, it's free as in freedom, which means that everything is up to you. You can choose whatever you want, and you can configure anything to your liking. You can make everything look the way you want, uh, which is going to take a lot of time. So you should not use Gen2 if, you, if you're not a person who wants to configure everything. If you're not a person who wants to choose everything, if you don't want that freedom, and if you don't want to take the time to go through all those choices, then you should not use Gentoo. You should use something a lot more simple. So that's that for now.